Okay, we're really thrilled to have this topic today, Navigating the Return to School After Childhood Stroke. I'm Mara Yale, I'm your host and the um, co-chair -co of our Parent Advisory Council for the Pediatric Stroke and Brain Injury Education Program. Um, and I'm just gonna give an overview very briefly before we get to hear from Marina and her mom, Sasha. So as you know, stroke in childhood at birth or later in childhood can affect the whole lifespan. And care through Mass General actually also can complement uh, the lived experience and support the, what the family goes through at any stage from acute through um, hurdles and challenges along the way. We, uh, we just wanna remind everybody that this is educational and not uh, healthcare guidance or advice. So especially when we get to the Q&A part of the session, if you have questions, um, please ask them in as general a way as you can. And if you have questions about your own child's care, then go ahead and, and seek uh, medical attention. We're, we're super proud of what we've accomplished in the last four or five years. And we've recently been to a couple different conferences to highlight it. So what you're seeing on the left is just a part of a poster that we presented two weeks ago at Child Neurology Society in, in Vancouver. So you'll see as um, children develop in all domains, they may need support and help, particularly after stroke or early brain injury. And through this educational program, we're building this whole network of partners who help support families. So we've been delivering content for four years, some in person, mostly online. Uh, we're reaching more and more families who need this information and partnering with more who can both share additional information on new topics as well as share what we've already curated with more families who might benefit. So please um, share the links that I've sent that all of you uh, use to find your way here and uh, encourage others to make use of these resources. All right, I'm gonna switch shares now to uh, Marina. Okay, so we're starting with a pre-recorded video of Marina and her mom, Sasha, and then we will switch to a live presentation and that will be followed by a Q and A. Hi, and I am in seventh grade. And how old are you? Oh, I'm 13. And who am I? Yeah, my mom. I am your mom. And what's my job? Speech therapy. Yep, I'm a speech therapist. It's good to have a live-in speech therapist, yes? Uh, <laughs> so what happened to you um, almost three years ago? I had a ruptured exam. You did. How old were you? Ten. Yeah, you were ten, fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's been almost three years since your stroke. Um, what do you still struggle with now? Walking, mm -hmm. talking, and reading. Yeah, those are still hard, yeah. Uh -huh. So in that first whole year, even year and a half after your stroke, could you talk? No. No, what couldn't you do? I couldn't turn my voice on. You couldn't turn your voice on at all? Yeah. At all, that's right. So, um, in that first, probably first two years, um, a lot of speech therapists who we had urged us to get communication devices and to really focus um, most of our energy into Marina learning um, how to use communication devices. Um, what did one speech therapist say to you? Don't put all my eggs in the speech basket. That's right. And what did we do? 
Just uh... we put all our eggs in the speech basket. That's right. So, um, you know, we know that AAC is um, it's a lifesaver for a lot mm -hmm. of people, right? Yeah. Could me and Daddy understand everything? Yeah. How did you communicate with us? Um, uh, I think this for yes, this for no. Say that again. This for yes and this for no. This for yes, this for no. Uh, uh, we could tell by your face. Okay. We understood everything, yeah. right? Yeah. We sure did. So even though, you know, a lot of speech therapists um, urged us to get AAC, what did we do? What did we focus on? Getting my voice back. Getting your voice back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We did absolutely everything. Do you remember blowing through straws and uh, kind of jumping on your tummy to get your breath support and prolonging? Ah, we started there. Do you remember any of that? That's good. Can you talk now? Yes. <laughs> Can everybody understand you? Yes. Yes. So, um, we get home um, from inpatient rehab. We're putting all our eggs into, spe into yeah. the speech basket. Um, and now it's close to the end of the summer, right before fifth yeah. grade. Do you remember that time? Yeah. You do, sort of? Yeah, sort of. So, mom. Yeah. Did my school do anything to help? Your school? So, you know, schools don't see a lot of pediatric stroke and thank goodness for that a lot of kids don't have strokes right so mm -hmm. um you still couldn't really talk by then um and our school district urged us to send you to a special school that's about 45 minutes from our house where all of the kids have significant disabilities all of them and it's a school where a lot of kids can't talk and use communication devices wait i didn't not go to that school did i no you didn't we did not send you to that school even though we were urged to do that um by a lot of administrators here at um, Needham Public Schools. Why didn't you send me there? Huh? Why didn't you go for me? Well, we didn't. We didn't send you there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why we didn't send you there. Mm. So, Marina, I'll let you answer that question. What do we know about stroke recovery? You have to. Stimulate, stimulate, right? stimulate the brain to recover. Stimulate the brain all day mm. long, right? Yeah. So, you know, we know that neuroplasticity um, is so important, right? Mm -hmm. And the way for stroke recovery is to stimulate the brain, and stimulate your body. Um, that's what we know for sure. And we knew that that wouldn't happen if we were in the car for like an hour, two hours a day going to and from the school. We know that that would not help with neuro fatigue. And we also knew that, well, you know, being with a, other kids, most of who are also using AAC devices, that's not going to really help your language because he's had aphasia as well, right? Mm -hmm. So what did me and daddy decide to do? We decided to go on. We decided to what? To go on. Drink a lot of wine? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, yes, but what else did we decide to do? So based on what we know about neuroplasticity, especially in the first couple of years, we knew that we did not want to spend a lot of time in the car and we wanted to maximize all the therapies that you had right mm -hmm. so right around that time um i started reading um a bunch of um books by a certain author who wrote james and the giant peach and matilda who wrote those books oh, 
And who was his wife? Patricia O'Neill. And what was she famous for? She was a famous movie star. Yes, and what did you guys have in common? We both had a stroke. That's right. Patricia Neal had a massive stroke. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. Raoul Dahl did was, mm -hmm. do you remember? Mm -hmm. Kind of did what I did. So he organized mm -hmm. all their friends to come over for an hour each a day, totaling about six or seven hours a day. Again, not speech therapists, not PTs, just friends coming over and working with Patricia Neal six hours a day, seven days a week. So that gave me some ideas, didn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is basically what we created for Marina at home um, for that uh, first uh, year and a half after coming home from inpatient rehab. Now, what you see, we absolutely did traditional speech therapy and physical therapy, both in-house and at um, outpatient clinics uh, close to us. But I only put one picture of traditional speech therapy in there because just like Raul Dahl and Patricia Neal, therapy can come in absolutely... Um, every you know every size and shape right mm -hmm. so what other therapies did we do that year what did you do we did hiking speech therapy mm -hmm. um field hockey mm -hmm. skiing swimming and horseback riding and, and canoeing Yes, we did. So, um, and that picture you see on the left with you in the ballet bars, mm -hmm. um, that's with a student PT mm -hmm. who was well, learning to be a PT and she yeah. was free. So, um, and the field hockey girls, yeah, right? You used to play field mm -hmm. hockey. They came yeah. over and they volunteered their time to mm -hmm. play with you yeah. every single weekend. Mm -hmm. So all of this added up to amazing PT and OT, didn't it? Yeah. Yep. So now uh, mm. you're home mm. for a whole year mm. doing mm. all these therapies, all these fun therapies that you didn't even know were therapies, right? Um, yeah. And now it's spring of what would be your fifth grade year, yeah. right? And Abby, your mm. OT, mm helped you to start going back to school just for a little bit only a couple of hours per week just for art and music right mm -hmm. so did um abby go with you to school yeah and she stayed with you for all the, the art yeah right the music uh -huh. yep yep and the most important thing the only reason you were going is because what did you want friends friends to see all your friends uh -huh. and here you are you are seeing all your friends at school yeah. so important and that was our primary goal uh -huh. back uh -huh. then and abby abby can talk about this some more but abby really really helped in reintegrating you even just for a few hours a week back in school, right? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So how did how did it make you feel being back at school after a whole year and a half? Good. I love seeing everyone. Yeah, I bet you did. Uh, I bet you did. Yeah. And again, we didn't overdo it. Um, Abby can explain kind of what she did with you at school, and how she helped you. Um, but it was only a couple of hours a week mm -hmm. right and then we continued mm -hmm. all the therapies mm -hmm. so abby and tracy um comprised and continue to comprise kind of our primary team of therapists ot and speech and both abby and tracy work from 
they use the person-centered therapy approach, also called life participation approach, where who is the expert? Me. Yes, you, exactly. You are the expert and we are all a team, right? Mm -hmm. And Abby mm -hmm. and Tracy set goals with you collaboratively together, right? What does Tracy always ask? What do you want to work on? What do you want to work on? <laughs> Exactly. And then what does she do? She helps me work on it. Exactly. So we had, mm. you know, a lot of specific, we had a lot of speech therapists who yeah. did not use this approach and, you know, who really urged us to uh, huh. do, you know, different things that mm. were not important to you. Mm. Right. Mm. And thank goodness for Tracy and Abby that, mm -hmm. you know, the, basically you were the expert. They asked you what you wanted or go you wanted and then worked backwards from that mm -hmm. to do the mm -hmm. therapy to help you achieve that goal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Marina, what was so this is the end of fifth grade right mm -hmm. and what did you say were the most important things to you what were your goals school and friends tell me more go back to school yeah and see your friends yeah yes just two big goals mm -hmm. only two <laughs> yeah so by telling abby and tracy these two goals did you know that you basically summarized decades of research on neuroplasticity what <laughs> yes you did so we know that meaningful social participation drives neuroplasticity especially in a with people with aphasia to get your language back we know that we know years and decades of research has shown that cognitive and emotional engagement, meaningful interactions, a sense of belonging are so important for stroke recovery. And last but not least, identity, right? So you want it to be back with your friends, right? Mm -hmm. With your peers, mm -hmm. your identity, you're still Marina, right? Mm -hmm. So, at about that time, we started to write a book, which is now published. You can get it on Amazon. In that book, um, we had other young stroke survivors contribute. And what do you all have in common? We lost all our friends. Loss of friends. 100% of the young stroke survivors lost all their friends. 100%, including you, right? Yeah. So we know that social participation, right, truly is crucial for neuroplasticity, for recovery. But how, how can you do that if you lost all your friends, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we do that then? Go to school. Go to school. School is the one place where you can see your pre-stroke peers interact with your pre-stroke peers and be in a language rich environment. So our, the only hope for social, true meaningful social participation is be with friends, be with friends where at school. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the catch 22. We know that being with peers at school, mm -hmm. Is a catalyst for recovery mm -hmm. but um the the sorting hat comes in to yeah. play doesn't it like in harry yeah. potter and the sorting hat sorted students into houses uh, uh, was the hat always right no no the hat thought it was right yeah but it wasn't and i call the sorting hat aka the standardized test because mm -hmm. um at the end of fifth grade, mm -hmm. right before the mm -hmm. summer of sixth grade, mm -hmm. 
Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the school said, well, you want to come back, you have to do some testing, some standardized testing, which we know are not normed on kids who have had dominant hemisphere strokes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, do you remember a teacher came to our house and did a bunch of tests with you? Yeah. What did you have to do? I had to read and write. Read and write. Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. that, how was that for you? Hard. Really hard, really mm -hmm. hard because where you had your stroke mm -hmm. makes reading very, very hard, right? Mm -hmm. But every time if I spelled words to you, like really hard words, you could tell me the word right away, right? Yeah. But because it's a standardized test, those answers were not accepted, were they? No. Well, so I read a lot to you, right? Mm -hmm. I still do. And what books were your favorites back then? Harry Potter. Did you understand everything? Yeah. Yeah. All six Harry Potter books. You were, uh -huh. I read them to you after your stroke. Yeah. You remember everything. Yeah. And your vocabulary, your mm -hmm. receptive vocabulary, which mm -hmm. we found out later that year is 99th percentile. Woo, sky high. But when you were asked to read words and say what they were, define them, were you able to read those words? No. 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 And did the standardized test allow for the teacher saying those words out loud? No. No. So it's no surprise that your scores were really, really not good, as in really not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, these are kind of very general kind of um, uh, definitions of, not even definitions, but the types of classes, right? Mm -hmm. They have at public mm -hmm. school. There's the mainstream and that's with everybody. That's what you wanted, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a sub-separate, but still grade level, just smaller class going at a slower level. There's sub-separate where they're not doing grade level work, right? And there's the different school, which, you know, we were urged to do that. We said no, but um, based on those standardized tests, mm -hmm. you were placed um, in a sub-separate class that wasn't doing sixth grade uh, lessons or curriculum at all. So you were still going part-time. And do you remember mm -hmm. what you took last year? Or you did art. I think science. Science, and that was mainstream and with your peers. Math and reading. I think you just did reading. So you did art. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, 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 you were right. You did art, mm -hmm. math, reading, and science. See, you're absolutely right. And science was in the mainstream class, and art was in the mainstream class. So there were a lot of great things last year in sixth grade. Um, you loved science. You yeah. learned a lot, right? Look at the art you made. It's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And honestly, you know, three times a week of art, that was like the best PT, except for Abby, right? Mm -hmm. That was the best OT, I should say, OT. Yeah. Um, and you also took an elective um which was coding do you remember you did a little technology technologies and uh you did some cool projects some animation projects oh, yeah. and there's a picture of you and some friends yeah. um the friend on the left what's her name Kathy. yes she was a new friend yeah you didn't know her before your stroke no you met her in your mainstream class in science yeah. right she said, can I be partners with you? Yeah. Said yes. Mm. And friends ever since, right? Yeah. And Tracy, your speech therapist, worked very, very closely with the speech therapist, Miss Hundley, from mm. last year. It was the best um, collaboration that I've ever seen absolutely amazing. And I've been in the field for 27 years. Um, they worked so closely together. Um, and Tracy will talk a lot more about that 
about exactly kind of what they did and how they did it and how you were supported so well in school and at home. And when it came time to, mm, you know what, these are not the goals in your IEP, but let's tweak some things like get you a lunch bunch because you need the social interactions. Now that you can talk more, the speech therapist made it happen within one week, <laughs> right? So the not so good things um, in your class where you were not doing sixth grade work, um, you were kind of just writing short words, right? Mm -hmm. um, you were um, kind of, you weren't reading or you weren't listening to high level literature. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the math that you were doing? It was kind of addition, right? Addition, subtraction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of counting money. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like that? No. Why? Because I'm not doing the higher math. Because you weren't doing the higher math mm -hmm. and you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. We knew you could. So lesson learned. So now you're in what grade? Seven. You're in seventh grade, right? Mm -hmm. And we decided, so you're taking, what are you taking this year? Math. Math. Reading and writing. Mm -hmm. and, and art. And art, that's right. And you are in a, for math and for ELA, mm -hmm. you're in a sub-separate small class a language-based class mm -hmm. but the big difference is that it's yeah. grade level grade level yeah. what are you doing for math higher math higher math mm -hmm. what are you learning in math algebra yeah you're doing algebra yeah and for ela are you reading the cat sat in the hat no no what are you reading Good books. Good books, short stories yeah. for middle school kids. Yeah. You're analyzing literature. Now, mm -hmm. you're reading is reading, whether you're listening to the books, yeah. somebody reading aloud, mm -hmm. or reading them yourself. Yeah. That's reading is reading. Yeah. You're listening to these books. Mm -hmm. You're discussing them in class. Mm -hmm. It's okay that you listen to them, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the guiding principle for us and for your amazing teachers this year is that presume competence. Assume that you can do it unless otherwise shown mm. and then figure mm. out, you know, how to help. Mm. But mm. presume competence. Mm. It's our guiding mm. principle. Mm. Mm. It wasn't there last year. But it is now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Abby and Tracy um, will talk a lot more about um, what they're doing to help to to help the educators presume competence about you, and you know to work with the school together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Tracy and Abby are going to talk a lot about kind of the specifics um, of their role. But I think that I can, um, if I may, summarize everything that they're doing into two principles, two principles. One is decreasing cognitive load. Now, do you have trouble writing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were righty, and now what? I'm a lefty. And that's still hard, yeah. right? The numbers are sometimes reversed. Yeah. And what happens when you do algebra problems and you write, you have to you sometimes erase mm -hmm. and then you cross out numbers and yeah. by the end of a single problem, you're like, wait, where was I? So uh, that's so much cognitive load, right? And that takes away from actual math. So we are reducing that cognitive load by either color coding, a lot of color coding, or simply doing the same math, but on a computer mm. in a software program where you don't need to write anything just drag and drop and what we found actually just recently last week for every one math problem on paper mm. you were able to do seven 
similar problems in IXL on your iPad in the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's true. So reduce cognitive load and finally apply principles of universal design for learning. This one is huge. This I can't say enough about. Uh, principles of UDL, basically, the way to summarize it is different ways of learning information and different ways of showing that you know, showing what you know. So instead of reading mm -hmm. all the wonderful literature in your ELA class, what do you do? I listen. You listen to it. And to show, to demonstrate your knowledge, instead of pencil and paper tests, this is actually from last year. What did you do for the science test? We did a presentation. We did a presentation. That's right. On the, on all like five, six, seven, however mm -hmm. many there are body systems, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You did an awesome job. So Abby and Tracy are, you know, the really focusing on principles of universal design for learning, which is basically helping the school to figure out what are the best ways of representing information to you, visual, audio, kinesthetic, um, various ways that you can learn, right? Get the information in here and various ways to express your knowledge. Okay. And this is absolutely crucial because, you know, when we looked at your standardized tests from before fifth, uh, for, from before sixth grade, it's like, well, you can't read, you can't write. So remember you were the low class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you can listen and if you can talk, mm. whoa, <laughs> you, you can do algebra and grade level yeah. ELA, right? Yeah. And Abby and Tracy are playing and will play a big role in determining all of this this year. So to wrap up, um, Katie Novak is, uh, she's a consultant for uh, a lot of universal design for learning um, components. And I love this quote more than any other quote I've ever seen. Learning from a grade level appropriate curriculum is not a privilege. It's a right for all students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks so much, uh, Marina and Sasha. I'm now going to pass it off to Abby, I believe. And Abby and Tracy are going to share a presentation. Thank you, Marina and Sasha for sharing your story. Um, and I know I can speak for Tracy also when I say for really trusting us to be part of your team. I met Sasha in April of 2021, a few weeks before Marina was set to be discharged um, from Rehabilitation Center. And so this was four months after her stroke. And I met Marina the day that she came home. Um, it's really been such an honor um, to just be a small part of this um, press team and helping to support her um, re-entry to home, uh, to home and to school. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, next. Um, I went to Boston University um, for undergrad and graduate work in occupational therapy, and I have been an occupational therapist for 17 years, primarily with uh, pediatrics, and hopefully um, no one will tell that I am much more comfortable speaking with children than I am with adults. Um, I have worked in a variety of settings, including with um, including early intervention, schools, hospitals, home care, my interest in neurorehabilitation and working with families and children um, after uh, brain injury and stroke led me to become a certified brain injury specialist and I currently have a private practice. I'm Tracy, I'm a speech pathologist. I've been working with Marina for about two years now. Um, when she and I met, she was not able to use her voice to speak, but that didn't mean she had she didn't have a lot to say. 
So we've been working um, on her goals ever since. I This is a little bit about me. I um, went to Northeastern. I got my undergrad and graduate degree there in speech pathology. I have worked in all the same settings that Abby has worked in. Um, I think that's why um, it's given me a lot of insight in how to support people because I've seen all different settings. Um, so I've worked early intervention, uh, substantially separate schools, um, regular education schools, rehab hospitals, home care. I'm also a certified brain injury specialist, um, as I really enjoy working in neuro rehab. And I'm also a certified lactation counselor, um, because I have found that there's just not enough support for people who, um, who want to, um, do feeding. So that's another thing that I do. Um, and I also have a private practice, uh, just like Abby. So life is made up of occupations, which are ev meaningful everyday activities. And for a child that includes playing, sports, social interaction with peers, eating, self-care, and the roles they have, such as being uh, a sibling, a son or a daughter, a friend, and a student. When a child has a stroke or a brain injury, uh, participation in these valued activities is often disrupted for a variety of reasons. The goal of occupational therapy is really to increase a child's participation in these meaningful activities. And today we are going to be focusing on a child's role as a student. Uh, three things that I think are uh, really important to remember uh, as an occupational therapist and things that I bring into my practice are, as uh, Sasha um, talked about before, really a child and family centered practice. They are the driving force, their goals, uh, their goals and interests are what are going to drive the sessions, using also using what is available in your environment for therapy. Therapy can be done anywhere, as you saw with Marina, horseback riding and skiing, and really thinking about outside the box solutions, especially when we are going back to school and what are the creative solutions to the challenges we now may be faced with. Next. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a speech therapist. Um, speech pathologist, there are a lot of different ways that my profession is called. And um, I've always said that for me, titles matter less. So, you know, you can call me whatever you want to call me, but my job is to be here and to support patients and their families. So speech pathologists, speech therapists, SLPs, we treat a variety of disorders. So communication disorders, um, for some people that might include working on speech production, uh, a lot of people who have had a stroke also will have apraxia or dysarthria. Those are motor speech conditions. We work on swallowing disorders, voice disorders, and also cognitive communication disorders. So things like memory, attention, problem solving, and executive functioning. Those are within the scope of practice of a speech pathologist. Um, so the role of the speech pathologist in stroke brain injury aphasia, again, is to support the person in their family, any caregivers as well, friends, um, and to support in any and all of those areas and always coming from a person-centered approach. Um, and treatment may look different at different times. For example, with Marina, when I first came and started working with her, we had worked on some feeding and eating. And then when she no longer needed support with that, we worked on her voice. And then when she got her voice, we started to work on school reentry. So it's really whatever is the most important thing to the uh, person. That's what uh, we work on. So when we're thinking about returning to school, we want to highlight some of the challenges that may potentially impact students after stroke or brain injury. Not all children will experience all these challenges. It will depend on the area of the brain that is in, um, impacted, but these are the things to just keep in mind um, and for the school to be made aware of and for teachers and uh, school therapists to be thinking about. So I'll highlight a few. So motor impairments, such as gross and fine motor, so gait, mobility, writing, feeding disorders. We want to make sure that there, if there's a swallowing disorder, the child's having the appropriate caloric intake for the cognitive demands of school. 
cognitive um, impairments and academic or learning difficulties, which Tracy will touch on later and how to support that. So we're thinking of memory, attention, executive functioning, fatigue, medical issues or something I always point out as well that the school wants to be thinking about uh, and communication with nurses. So we're thinking about seizures or if a child has a G-tube, the social, uh, emotional or behavioral difficulties a child may have um, when returning. Um, and we want to think about cortical vision impairments. So visual field cuts, neglect, these are just things to be keeping in the back of our mind as we're going to uh, start the process for reentry. Next. So uh, two states have established programs which helps a family um, and school districts be able to support children that are returning. In 2007, Pennsylvania created Brain Steps, which is strategies teaching educators, parents, and students. It is a brain injury school reentry consulting program that really works to connect the medical, rehabilitation, and education sectors and families following a brain injury. So it is a collaborative program between the Brain Injury Association of your state, the health department, and the Department of Education. Colorado modeled, um, implemented this model as well. And this, um, their website provides a lot of really good trainings for um, families to, to look at, even if you are not in these states. So what to do if you are not in Pennsylvania or Colorado. Um, some of the important things we want to think about before your child is going to be going back to school is making sure there's communication with the entire team. So that includes any outside um, private providers, doctors, the teachers in the building. We want to start looking at the process of an individualized education plan, IEP, which we will discuss later in more detail. And within that, we want to think about the accommodations versus modifications um, related to those challenges that I mentioned a couple slides ago. And then we also want to think about the staff training. So what do, do we need to um, teach the school before we're going to have our ch the child come back? So we have divided um, some of the educational needs a child may have when they're returning to school into sensory motor, psychosocial, and academic and cognitive, which Tracy and I will go through. So sensory motor, this is uh, really looking at the physical and environmental space first. And as it relates to any motor um, deficits your child may now be experiencing, uh, it is one of the first things I start with when it, before a child is going to go into the building. So I will ask the school district if they will uh, let, allow me to come in um, and just sort of see what the space looks like and if there's gonna be any mobility challenges uh, it's something that anybody can do as a parent. I strongly encourage you, you to ask because it's obviously not realistic that everybody will have a private provider who might be able to go into the building. And some of the things um, that I look for and I will teach you to sort of be a detective for are I will um, ask to see the building when the hallways are crowded so I can see what that's going to look like. I'm going to analyze the hallways to see how much space is there. What does it look like when lockers are being opened? What is the bathroom? setup look like. Um, in an ideal world, um, we would have universal building design uh, where everything would be ADA um, compliant, which is not how it is in some of the older buildings. And even if it does meet um, standards that might not um, fit what your child needs or what they've been practicing on at home. So with that, we would look at things like the bathrooms. This was something that um, comes up a lot, especially with teens. Uh, even if there is an accessible bathroom with guardrails, it's often um, in a bathroom with other stalls. And if a child needs an aid to help in the bathroom with them, um, socially that might be embarrassing for them and they might not feel comfortable. So asking if there's a single stall that they can use perhaps in the nurse's office. Another thing we look at, which came up with Marina when she was re-entering school, was what do the elevators look like if a child needs an elevator? Um, in fifth grade, Marina was not yet independently using the stairs, and so we had considered using an elevator. And when we got there, um, she, as we joked, it was what we called a Harry Potter elevator that uh, she and I were a little bit nervous to go into because it was um, one of those freight elevators. 
Uh, so we made it a priority that she would use the stairs and we practiced that. Another key thing to bring in with you might be measuring tape to sort of measure what the rise on stairs are to see if that's what your child has been practicing with at home or um, in a an outpatient physical therapy uh, setting. Other things I think about are the playground and recess. Are there uh, activities and, and equipment that your child is going to be able to use to, to be with peers? Uh, we also look at the same with the gym. We look at lighting and noise level and all those factors. Um, so within sensory motor, some of the things we want to think about and some of the things that um, came up with Marina is tone management and making sure that the school has some education around that. The OTs, to no fault of their own in school, are, do not often see um, children with dystonia or hypertone. And, um, so they are just going to need some support in how to handle, handle that and some of the strategies. Um, some of the things that worked well for Marina was vibration, having stress balls available. And so those are things I would uh, work with to educate the school therapists. Uh, also, just explaining that with um, medical management for tone such as, and Botox, sometimes that wears off. And so a child's level of support that they might need for fine motor activities will also fluctuate based on the timing of those appointments. Things to also consider in this area are cortical vision impairment. And this is often a hard one. I find schools um, explaining a visual field cut when a child doesn't have visual acuity challenges and there's a lot of really wonderful resources on perkins.org. They actually have a lot of um, webinars and information on having a multi-sensory approach for students that might have some um, visual neglect or visual field cuts and um, really help to, for teachers to be able to make curriculum accessible. Uh, and we, I touched on the mobility in terms of navigating the um, hallways and area. Uh, one of the things um, that I often think about is the seating for children and how low is a chair. This is another thing we did with Marina. Um, we noticed that the seats were much lower in her classrooms than they were at home. So we asked to borrow a chair that we could practice on uh, so she would be able to practice on that same depth. Also considering um, how a child's getting into the chairs, uh, are the desks attached um, and how they are navigating with a backpack. Um, other things we, we want to look at here is overstimulation, noise sensitivities, how loud is the environment, and what uh, accommodations would we need for that. And then physical endurance. Um, and once again, the medical piece, which is really important to discuss with nursing. The psychosocial piece, um, because there's so much overlap with what OTs do and uh, speech pathologists, uh, Tracy and I will both be um, discussing this here. So one of the things we did before Marina went back to school was make sure to set up some peer groups with friends um, pre-stroke that she had. So you can see in some of the pictures, we had what we would call girls group on Sunday afternoons where Marina would pick the activity that her friends would do and she would pick who to invite over. And we would do some art projects. We'd practice playing the games that she was going to be playing in her classroom setting. Um, and another thing um, that Marina and I did was some community outings. So you can see there is a picture of her sitting at a round table with a little girl. That's my daughter, actually. Uh, Marina was saying she'd really like to meet my Stella. And so um, Marina was really uh, the big sister slash babysitter in this scenario where she showed and helped Stella to order and assemble a cupcake. It was a really fun experience for everybody involved. Um, and uh, one of the things that we have on this slide is just that um, there is an increased, increased risk of depression. Um, Marina, you heard her earlier explain that there's really a sense of identity that's looped into the peer groups and that when that peer group goes away, that can affect um, a person's identity and how they see themselves. So when thinking about school, returning to school and thinking about peer groups, it's, it's really important, not only just for the neuroplasticity, but also for um, the psychosocial aspect of things. 
one of the other pieces with this is um, depending on uh, the family's comfort level is providing some education to the classmates. We had started with a smaller group of friends that Marina felt comfortable with explaining about her stroke and ways that this is often done is either the parents or the child themselves if they can recording a video or giving a presentation to the class so that peers understand before they are coming back. Uh, I think involving um, Marina in this was wonderful in that she was able to first describe what had happened as she would say a brain boo-boo and then over the years seeing her being able to explain it um, a little bit uh, more in detail and really uh, learn to advocate for herself. I think this is a big first step in advocating um, for being able to answer questions to peers and sort of that relating to others. And I just want to reiterate that it's not an all or nothing situation. So if a student is not ready to return to school, that does not mean that you can't create situations for socialization to occur with classmates. It can be very helpful for both the uh, family, the person and the friends in a quiet environment uh, to get together and catch up where that, um, that situation may not present itself in a very busy science class, for example. And you can see we started initially just having one or two peers at our groups and then expanded to, I think at the end we had five or six girls and eventually a tie-dye birthday party in Marina's backyard. <laughs> so in thinking about the academic um, and cognitive needs, I think the main focus is that students are going to need to relearn how to learn. Everybody has different learning styles and the way that uh, children after a stroke or a brain injury learn maybe look very different than how they uh, previously um, learned information. So I wanna just touch on the difference between adaptations and modifications. Adaptations are physical and environmental strategies that allow a student to access the core curriculum. They do not fundamentally alter the assignments or tests. So this will include extra time, separate testing rooms, um, dictating your answers if there are some fine motor concerns and writing is uh, challenging, uh, having books, uh, audio books, those would be all examples of adaptations. Modifications are when you are adapting the curriculum um, to meet new goals and expectations that are not in line with the core curriculum. And these will fundamentally alter assignments. So this would be doing math that might be a different grade level than peers or reading um, different books. Yeah, take myself off mute. Earlier, we had touched on what this IEP is. And in making this presentation, I learned that in depending on where you are, some people call it an individual education program, while others call it an individual education plan. This is a legal document um, that is created specifically for each child um, for when they return to school. It is something that is created not only by the staff at the school, but also by caregivers. And I often encourage students, especially as they're older, to either write a statement for the IEP meeting or to participate in the IEP meeting to make sure that their wants and needs are met. This is something that's specific to the United States, but I know that some other countries out there offer something similar. It would just be called something different. And this exists uh, for two main laws, which is the IDEA and FAPE. And if you would like more information about that, we included some links at the end. There's a lot of uh, minutia that goes along with that. Um, but it is a document explaining how each child will participate and access the curriculum given their disability. So in general, there are many different components of the IEP. But, uh, you know, going sort of from left to right here, thinking about what current levels are. Earlier, Sasha had talked about how there were standardized tests um, that are talked about. And in the current level section, a school might present what those current tests are. And that's a section where outside assessments can be presented and considered um, and tests can be explained and interpreted. Um, goals will be created together. So this might be what the uh, student's goals are for their time at school, uh, 
goals for them to meet regarding specific academic requirements. Then it also includes services. So will that be special education classrooms? Will that be speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy? Where that will occur? Will it be in the classroom? Will it be on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Will it be group? Um, and then talking about, um, I feel like the in yellow there, that's the uh, buzzword, least restrictive environment. So earlier you had heard Sasha talk about how there are different levels. So a mainstream classroom, um, a substantially separate classroom that's going to be grade level, and then one that is not grade level, and then a completely different school. And so all of the information is considered when working on figuring out what the least restrictive environment is. And then also what is talked about, as Abby chatted about earlier, the accommodations and modifications. So accommodations meaning um, things that can be adjusted so that the student can participate and modifications are things that are changed um, and the level will be different. Um, one thing that I always encourage parents to do is to not sign the IEP during the IEP meeting. Some families will feel pressure from the school to sign that document, being told that they can't, um, you know, services won't start until they're, it's signed. Um, but when um, receiving all that information, it's very complex and it can be very helpful to uh, bring that back, reread it again with a um, with some time after the meeting, you may hear some very emotional things, um, especially when you're talking about um, some of the assessments. Um, families can also bring other providers if there's an outside provider that you would like to come to help understand what's being stated in the IEP, um, or you can bring other caregivers uh, so that you feel supported during the meeting. Um, and I have learned in my 15 plus years that Families don't always realize that there are these options out there and that they often feel much better during the process, knowing that they don't have to sign anything or make a decision during the meeting. Um, so one of the things that um, we had talked about um, earlier and that Sasha and Marina talked about was this idea of a comprehensive program. Um, and school is a very, very important part of a comprehensive program to support a child. Um, but what's really important is that we think of um, treatment therapy school coming from the point of view as a whole person versus the disability. So it's really important that we move from this idea of the medical model of here is the disability and this is how we are going to treat the disability and it's really important to involve family, friends, the community, um, and that therapy, school, recreation time should be balanced because it really, it, all of it is important. Um, I know that everyone that's presented today has said the same thing. And, you know, maybe everybody has heard it enough, but it's really so important to ask the person what they want to work on and follow their lead. There are many different studies and papers and frameworks that have come out. There's the life participation approach to aphasia, the different F words for development, which is something that I learned about very recently, which I very much love. The ICF framework, we're all saying the same thing. And yet you may find entering into a school that it's different. And instead it's coming from this point of view of this is a disability and here's how we're going to treat the disability. And what we really should be saying is here is this person and here's what they want to do and here's what they like and here's what they don't like and here's what's hard for them. And let's create a comprehensive plan. And again, it's not an all or nothing. So if a student is ready for some tutoring, but they're not ready to return to school full time, that can become part of that comprehensive program. If a student is ready to return for one class, but does not have the cognitive or physical endurance to return for a full day, that's something that's also okay. And during the IEP meeting, those are things that you can bring up and talk about. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the IEP meetings is that families can call an IEP meeting at any time if something is working, if something is not working. And that's one of the components that was really helpful for me is that I was able to speak to the speech therapist and we were able to troubleshoot often in real time 
because we had that relationship where we could email or call. Um, so we've spoken a lot, but here are some of our final thoughts. Abby, I'll let you start. And as Tracy just talked about utilizing um, the child's interests and goals to really guide therapy, uh, Marina's goals were returning to school. And within that, um, she uh, really craved the social aspect. Her priorities were going to art. She really enjoys ELA. And so listening to what the uh, child is asking, what classes they're interested in and, and uh, making that a priority and figuring out how to make that happen. Uh, being creative, therapy can be done anywhere, anytime with anything. Going to school is therapy. Um, being around peers provided that stimulation that Sasha and Marina spoke about earlier. As Tracy um, just shared, having that open line of communication with the schools um, and continuing to update progress and goals. Uh, as we know, with brain injury, recovery um, is different than in other uh, disabilities, especially in the first one to two years. Uh, and so really making sure you're checking in at least every three months um, with during the IEP process. Uh, that continuous collaboration between um, therapist your child might see at home is important, as Tracy said, uh, speaking with the speech uh, therapist. And I've communicated with the OTs at school and with the teachers. Uh, and then most importantly, um, continuing to just ask questions and advocate uh, for your child because you are your child and you are the expert. Um, one of the stories that I just wanted to share that kind of loops all of that in is uh, Halloween is coming up and something that Marina told us that was really important to her was trick-or-treating with her friends. So again, collaborative effort, um, what device was going to be used for her to go trick-or-treating. Um, something that was difficult for her was walking and talking at the same time to be able to use the walker um, to talk with her friends and to say trick-or-treat really clearly. And so that's something that we worked on. It's really, really important to be flexible um, with what the goals are. And that can be difficult for some teachers who don't have the time and experience with brain injury, some therapists as well. There are a lot of really great training resources out there, and we've included some of them at the end of our presentation. And um, I encourage everybody to share information with the teachers, with the speech therapists, occupational therapists, if they feel like they're not quite understanding. One of the things that we have found is that sometimes Marina is being treated as if um, she doesn't understand what's going on in the classroom around her, even though she does, um, because perhaps the assessment is saying one thing, um, though the assessment is not normed for somebody who's had a brain injury. And so providing that information to the school and the therapist is really important. And that doesn't have to be something that comes specifically from a doctor or from another speech therapist. These are things that can be shared by family members. And again, links um, can be found towards the end of our presentation. So we include um, some different websites here. Um, and different research studies that talk about what we spoke about today. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, that was amazing, all four of you. So we're going to invite everybody to come on camera, if you can, and uh, use the opportunity to ask ask Marina questions, ask Sasha questions, Abby and Tracy, all of them are, are uh, open to discussion. I'm going to take a, a little bit of time here. I'm Dr. Mussolino from MGH Pediatric Stroke Clinic. Um, and first of all, I want to thank you for the incredible <laughs> resource you guys has just created <laughs> together. <laughs> um, it's it's so complex to to really tackle uh, how do you go back to school after brain injury or how do you enter school after brain injury if you're younger. And I don't think we can do better than just um, having Marina talk about like what did she needed to get to be able to integrate again and why was this important to her. Um, I have... Uh, a, a lot of different emotions as I was hearing the different uh, conversations. I'm a physician. I 
put these prescriptions that you try to get patients to get access to. And some people have the providers, some people don't have access to the providers. In Massachusetts, in the majority of the United States, we have the school system that has a mandate to provide certain services. Um, it is really remarkable to just remember one thing, which is go with the goals of the kid, which we tend to put a little bit on the side when we are thinking about what's needed, uh, almost as if you could standardize a, a therapy, like a prescription, you know, I give you 10 milligrams of blah, blah, blah. Um, and is the prescription is we have to really do something that they really want to work on and go with that development in what they acquire and move to the next call and the next call. And the other thing that I thought it was great, Marina, what you were able to say is like, rehab is not in a room necessarily <laughs> you show all this life of amazing experiences and that's truly how the brain learns and develops that's the normal rule for brain without injury why do we don't want to do that after brain injury we should even encourage it even more so i i want to thank you all of you for giving this resource um i do want to put a question to any of you which is what will be your one recommendation, if you do not have the ability to bring, um, so you found your good therapist somewhere and they are not necessarily able to communicate to the school, what could be done in that case? Uh, is it like bringing the IEP to that person, um, setting up a meeting? Do you have any recommendations for how to integrate when you have your champion, but they're not necessarily interfacing with your other parts, like your home or the community or the school? I can, yeah. I can start yeah, that if that's helpful. Um, so it sometimes is the case that I can't be at an IEP meeting uh, to support a family. So I encourage the family to ahead of time, maybe with the support of a speech therapist, OT, whatever the therapist is, to write out in general uh, with the support of the child themselves, what their goals are, what they would like to see. They have this idea of a vision statement that's often read at the beginning of an IEP meeting. Um, to go through that and then make sure during the meeting that all of your questions are answered. And if they're not, to then bring the IEP back um, to the other provider and go through it with them. Many parents say, you know, in the meeting, I thought it went really well and that my questions were answered, but I was feeling really emotional. And then when I went back and read the IEP meeting notes and the, the goals that a lot of the things that we had identified were most important weren't actually addressed. So taking some time and space, talking it over with somebody afterwards um, with that therapist. Um, and then another thing that I've done is to create either an email chain or a shared document with therapists. So, um, you know, I had standing meetings with another speech therapist at the end of the week. If there was something going on, I would email them. They would email me. Um, and in order for that to be HIPAA compliant, we did need to get permission from um, Marina's parents to do that. Um, but having, creating um, communication up front, figuring out a system that worked for everybody so that if there was something in the moment that needed to be communicated, it wasn't then trying to uh, figure out how to make the communication happen. We had already identified how we were going to communicate. Another thing I'll just add is I think um, it's very helpful sometimes that even if you can't have OT speech with you at the meeting to even just have a trusted friend who can be there to take notes for you so that you can go back and um, make sure that you didn't miss anything. And that way also, um, if you are somebody that can maybe separate out some of the emotion and so that you make sure that you did not miss anything. And I think that's um, really helpful to just have somebody else there. And I really like the idea of um, the shared document. Emails can get lost. They, they do get lost. <laughs> um, and so we have a shared Google Doc that's probably, I don't know, 10 people have access to it. The school providers, the teachers, you guys. And we add to it every week. And, and you know, every couple of weeks, I, you know, share it so that they get an email. Don't forget to look at the doc this week. So everything's on there. It's great. 
And I think that could uh, also made up for if you are not a Sasha specialist <laughs> in a speech therapy that can speak the language. Sometimes the communication is really important between the different providers and they need to have a place where they can uh, align. I think uh, that's, that's very important. So it, it takes away from a parent having to go the back and forth guys, which I, I see them. We do that to them in clinic. Uh, and then we put a note that is, has a lot of medical terms. And then they are supposed to translate this and tell the other providers or someone else, uh, just having communication um, flowing, I think it's very important to also decrease the stress uh, and this this anxiety that parents have, could have on not knowing, uh, am I saying the right thing <laughs> like to the other provider? And then one other thing that I have found very helpful is to take pictures of what is working, what's not working. Because I might say, for example, I need I need to make sure that the font is bigger. And so then photocopies are coming and the photocopies are very, very blurry, but they photocopied it and the font size is as large as I said. Um, so to say, this is an example of what I mean. This is what it has to be clear. This is the type of font that it needs to be. Here are some examples of what is not not clear for her or what is not going to be acceptable. And then, okay, who is going to be in charge of making sure that that accommodation or modification is set? If you don't have a photocopier that is big enough, what can we, um, what can we do creatively to make sure that that accommodation is met um, versus just asking sort of like it needs to be bigger, being specific, taking pictures and figuring out who at the school is going to be in charge of making sure that the accommodation is met. Yeah, the very first thing, Tracy, for mind, the very first document that I shared in the shared Google Drive was, um, you know, what work, what works for Marina, what should be done. And in there, we had a table of pictures. Do this, but don't do that. And some of the pictures that you saw in the presentation were from that document. I see you're, of, you're showing your book. <laughs> do you do you want to tell us more about it? Um, it has me and the school and yeah and some friends and friends and some friends like uh -huh. didn't want to see me because yes. I was different. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks. thanks. And thanks. I put a link to the book in the chat. I see a question from Jordan. Did you want to ask it, Jordan? Yeah, sure. Which one would you like for me to start with? I, I don't know. Whatever you... Oh, sure. Uh, so... Um, the it it's yeah it, you guys are blowing my mind I mean so much of my mind is being blown right now um in you know great ways mm -hmm. and I wish that um I could you know like turn back time and <laughs> went at the birth of my um, son who had a perinatal stroke um and my question is you know in terms of incorporating the child's interest and making that central and I have a third grader uh how do you do that without then killing the interest with therapy? Because I've done it so many times and I feel like I've also had like, you know, um, looped therapists into my damaging vortex of doing that. Like, oh, you're interested in no Nintendo? Let's work on no Nintendo. Oh, you want to do tennis? Like, let's go work on weight transfer. And then... <laughs> um, I think one of the things is, you know, that there's a difference between like, interest and motivation. So it can be hard to toe that line between, okay, he's interested in Nintendo, but maybe motivated to do X, Y, or Z. So for example, Abby was talking about the example about stairs. Maybe initially Marina was not super interested in climbing stairs, but then was motivated because she did not want to take the decrepit elevator at school that was not ADA compliant. <laughs> um, and then that sort of changes things. 
And one of the things that therapists have to do is to build rapport and then learn how to be flexible. I can't tell you how many times I have planned out the most perfect therapy session that includes every single goal with all of this evidence behind it. And Marina says, no. And then I just throw it out and, okay, well, what do you want to do today? Okay, we're going to do that. Um, because at the end of the day, that's where progress is made when when they're motivated. So I think it's trying to figure out that balance and and having kids write their own goals and then kind of working backwards from there. Marina, I'll piggyback on that. But what is this, this paper that you... Well, I know it's out. You know what? Your dreams. Marina wrote out the goals. Tracy and Abby, you know, they're on our fridge. This is Marina's writing. Um, I... I won't read all of them, but, you know, we shared these with the school. Mm -hmm. Some of these are talk about books, mm -hmm. more group projects, mm -hmm. extra time to say the answer mm -hmm. in class without the kids calling out. Mm -hmm. Those are her goals. And Tracy mm -hmm. took them and, okay, we're going to work on, but you're not crazy about this activity, but name as many things as mm -hmm. you can in this category, name as many, see, ah, but, you know, instead of, okay, well, we're naming things in the category. No, we're working on your very goal. Yeah. Yeah. You need extra time to say the answer. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's extra time. That's an accommodation. And there's, mm -hmm. you want to mm -hmm. be able to think quicker. We're working mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the activity is not, so basically the, the, the activity can be paired, you know, with the goal. Does that make sense? Or yes. the other yes. way around? Yeah. I want to uh, highlight something Tracy and you guys are saying. There is the goal and the you say motivation is like, like the reasons why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I want extra time to have to say my answers, and and that's the goal. But there is a lot of reasons on why that's happening. And I remember Tracy, you commented on another one, which had to do with having a conversation with friends. What's the reason on why? Like Marina wanted to work in something in particular, for example. So mm -hmm. if you can keep those two things, like there are goals, there are aims, but there are reasons why you're doing it, the motivators, uh, then the goal may stay there, but you use different days depending on the motivation, uh, maybe different tools or different uh, type of approach. And also know that we're asking a lot of kids to work through things that are really, really hard um, while balancing and that some days they're just not going to want to do things and that's okay. And then maybe we play a board game that day. Maybe I don't have you do an alternating attention task at two X speed repeatedly. <laughs> when And then to listen when Marina says, I can't today, I just can't. And okay. All right. No, because it's more important for us not to do that, that one day. And for me to respect what she says, then to force her through that. Um, and some days are just like that. Like some days I just can't, you know? And then if we're expecting that of a child, that's that's not fair. That's not developmentally appropriate. So trying to figure out what that balance is um, and being flexible and always coming back to what they want. Okay, well, you don't want to do that today. What do you want to do? Oh, I want to play blank slate. Great. In my brain, I've come up with 15 different ways that I can get back to my goals, what my goals are, based on what her goals are and motivation, but we're using the materials that she wants and um, without ruining rapport. I think one of the things I try to always um, keep in the back of my mind when I walk into anybody's house and I tell families is that um, a child's job is to play and that is how they learn and that is how they explore the environment. And Marina knows I always say she works more than a full-time job with how hard she's working. And um, and that's the goal of my sessions. It should be fun. These are children and um, to be in therapy where it's where they're um, when other peers are playing sports or going to extracurricular activities is really frustrating and hard. And so I, um, yes, we have the goals we're addressing, but I want it to be exciting for Marina and for all the children that I work with, uh, because that, that is childhood. And that is really how, um, every baby toddler, uh, learns 
um, learns. Thanks. Jordan, I, I want to queue up one your other question about friendship. Sure, sure. Uh, so I read this with my son, my third grader, and it was really touching. And I said, yeah, it's your friends, your classmates, friends, you know, daughter. And she too had a had a stroke. Um, and she, he also really liked that at the end, there were different stories. Um, and then a couple of days later, we were just, you know, we're kind of talking non sequiturs, um, you know, not my usual, like, how was your day? What'd you do? Who'd you see? You know, but like, just come kind of randomly. And he said very softly, you know, I don't have a friendship group. I don't really, I don't have close friends. And I, I, I wonder, I don't know, I can't see, but I wonder whether he felt more comfortable saying that um, after reading your book, um, which is very powerful. And I wanted to ask you what kind of advice you might have because I see his visible disabilities, like his leg brace as AFO, making it hard, like playing tag, you know, within 20 seconds, he's the tagger, everyone else, and he, for 20 minutes, you can't tag anybody else. I also, even more so, find his invisible disabilities. Um, you know, the, the longer time it takes him to process to produce and to process and his mobility and oh he bumped into somebody but he didn't really mean to his like I see both of those getting in the way How, what would you say to him Maria do you have advice um yeah adaptive sports adaptive sports yeah like what adaptive sports do you do like he mm -hmm. uh -huh. that you know adaptive sports that uh you know, kind of opens up a whole new community, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, for us, this is also new. Um, and this is, at least in our case, that's kind of where we're putting kind of our energies, um, the adaptive sports in those communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and things like, you know, we went to the movies with friends, yeah. right? you know, activities that are very social, but, you know, they don't involve playing tag and stuff like yeah. that. And from a uh, therapy standpoint, I'm hearing that this is really important to him, that socialization and a peer group is really important to him. So is there a way that, for example, this could be done at school, either in a small group um, where he selects some students and there's a game that's played and, and maybe he practices that game at home so that he understands how to play, how to do it, and then does that game at school when he feels more comfortable and understands it to give these really positive experiences with peers. Um, you know, that could be something to try as well. It's something I've seen work well with, with other kids um, one of the things Marina had told me is that she doesn't want these kids to be, you know, pulled, but they were all really excited about it. <laughs> they were like, but I really want to go. It sounds like a lot of fun. And I like spending time with Marina and I'd like to do this really cool thing with her at school. So I think some of it is the way that you frame it as well. Um, but I've seen that, that work really well. Um, and then I, I love what you said, Marina, about adaptive sports, because there is a community that exists of other kids going through the same things. Those are way better answers than I had. I was like, I didn't really have friends all high school. <laughs> yeah, it's friendship is hard for everybody. You know, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard as an adult to go and make new friends, right? I don't know if anybody else would <laughs> experience that, but, you know, and I imagine for kids, it's hard and middle school, Marina, um, and elementary school, it can be really hard in those environments too. And so there are different support staff that exist at the school whose job it is, who's got many more answers than probably any of us do and the tools and strategies in place. There are different social workers that exist um, at the school. Um, some special education teachers have some extra training on how to uh, support um, 
support that. There are different strategies speech therapists can work on specifically around conversation um, to help support all of that. But it, it sounds like he's writing goals for himself that he would like to have some friends and some peers. So that sort of, if I was a speech therapist where I would start and then kind of work backwards from there. But I think the fact that he's writing his his own goals there is is amazing. I think so too. That's very mature and amazing. And last year, I think you had like three lunch bunches, I think at school, right? You had like the lunch bunch, then you had a game group. And um, so basically- yeah okay, if we can't, if that's not happening out of, outside of school yet, let's do this in school, right? Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. Tracy said, your friends were happy to, cool, we don't have to be in the cafe, we can go play games with you, awesome. Mm-hmm. Work for everybody. Mm-hmm. Marina, I want to give you the last word because we're going to finish our session now. So if you want to offer something to the kids, like the other kids in your book or the kids who might watch this with their families, what would you say to them? Never give up. Never give up. Thank you so, so much.